Hello, Culture Matters Podcast. Before I introduce you to our guest, here's a quote I picked just for this episode. It is so hard to believe because it is so hard to obey. Soren Kierkegaard. Our guest today is a great friend of the Culture Matters Podcast. If you haven't heard him, look for him. Robert Freehafer, founder, CEO of Guardian Roofing and Siding, a dear friend of the podcast and myself, a mentor to many, the founder of a company that helps people with their roofing and siding. But not just that, with really uh, a lot more than that, I'd say, knowing this person, Robert, because of who he is as a leader, who he is as a friend of people, uh, how he grows his company is c- through culture and a heck of a lot, even more than that. Just uh, And we're going to unpack some of that today, I hope. If you're listening to this, it's kind of like a part two of our last episode. We talked about gathering with our people. We talked about um, faith. And uh, thanks for coming back on the show, my friend. I'm excited. Thanks for having me, Jay. Um, I'm excited to be in conversation with you again. And uh, really, like we like we talked a little bit, just the last the last podcast, the last time that we spoke on air, really was helpful for me to to think. It, it helps me, you know, change my frame, change my paradigm to uh, have have you as a medium in here and talk about things. So thanks for having me. I, I consider it a, pr- a, pl- a privilege and a pleasure to be here and have your time and uh, and work together on these awesome ideas. What do you say to people that live the because on a daily basis or a weekly basis or so on and throughout your career you've had to sell so what do you say to those that preach the gospel of they better buy or die buy or die i don't know that i've heard anyone ever say (laughs) those words like that I would have to think about that, but I'm sure, I'm sure, but I'll tell you what I have heard. I've had someone in my organization from the very beginning. I heard it. It was, it was taught by other people. And, and here's the statement. Some, and it was, it was from a, a salesperson's perspective talking about the clients. Now it could be used in many ways, but some will, some won't. So what? next right and and every time i heard it it would it would like turn my gut a little bit i believe that the person in my organization his name is matt white he's a great friend of mine and i and i would not even want to move forward out without sharing it because he utilized that he was one of the best door knockers in the very beginning that there was and he would he embraced the concept that every no is closer to the next yes so you have to to knock the doors you you want people to say no to you so then the next so then you're getting closer to the yes right like he embodied it he embraced it but when the word was said some will some won't so what next it just seems so uncaring and un on uh on in unalignment with the culture and what i was desiring and i think it's a reasonable statement some will like some will buy some won't buy that's true that is a true statement I think it's the so what, which which is like this not caring attitude. Now that can be healthy if it's like, all right, well, we we unearthed what we were, what they were, we weren't in alignment. So we decided not to work together for one reason or the other and, and headed up by one party, whether the client didn't want to work with us or we didn't want to work with the client, whatever that, however that would go. Um, it's just the so what. Now the concept. Truly, I think in other words, that would make sense would be some will, some won't. We've done our best. Let's help the next one, right? We've we've exhausted all options. Let's help the next one, right? Something along those lines. The so what 
really does seem like, ah, they missed out. It's almost like this, that's my connotation, right? That's my view of those words, a negative connotation, like they're missing out. They, it's their bad. I don't care about them. So what to me represents lack of care, empathy, desire to help, which, you know, after us working together so much, and even your introduction, when you said, yeah, we help people, he helps people. And it's like, yeah, that's, that is really the, I found through helping people, whether it's helping sales reps, guardians, helping staff, helping, you know, the community, helping the client, that it actually, it's a win, it's a win-win. Um, I'm also helping myself in that regard. So that's not an exact answer to your question about the buy or die, which I would assume it means buy from me or die out of my life, potentially in the, in the statement, but I really never heard this preaching, you say. Where, if you could expound on that, what do you think the sentiment is with buy or die what, that you've heard? Well, we, we, should, we should really hone in on this point for a little while. Um, like, I don't want to gloss over it. Because uh, the buy or die, I think it's from uh, like the Wolf of Wall Street or something like that you know, follow up until they buy or die. Like it's a perpetual um, forever follow-up type heuristic thought process. Mm -hmm. Never stop pers the pursuit. But when you mention the some will, some won't, so what? Maybe think of nihilism, like shutting down the, like a, like a shutdown in a sense, or, or um, like a meaninglessness that made me think of the, 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 like a psychological death or something to the, to the person, meaning, you know, so what next? Like, meaning if, if you didn't buy from me, you're nothing to me. And, and, and in this person's, you know, psychological defense, I can only imagine, well, I've also done it as well, it's emotionally, and I'd like your feedback on this, emotionally exhausting to be spit on and cussed at and put through suffering, emotional suffering, a lot of rational suffering to sell, you know, depending on the con, the context, depending on the medium. Um, so to just brief, like to briefly retort, I believe the context of buy or die is the idea of, you know, follow up. But when you say what you just said, it's interesting. I, I would argue, I'm curious of your thoughts on this. There could be a psychological death in the sense of like, you know, they're, I'm, they're dead to me. Like a closing off. And could that be a, a reaction? to the pain and suffering that comes with selling. And then I guess for the audience's sake, why does this matter, <laughs> right? Like, are there consequences to sales, to selling, to leadership uh, related to our, to our philosophies, how we philosophize? I will say one more thing on this. I, it really was catchy. So I'd argue that that's a catchy statement. And if one you know, to compete with a statement as catchy as that, it, you, you got to come up some, something a bit more catchy, more pizzazz than, 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 than the we've exhausted all options. Although I think that that's <laughs> not like, right. Cause it's like, we're yeah. competing. No, I understand a, that. I, a, a sexier adage. You're right. Like, so will, some won't, so what next that's, it flows. It's written like a poet. I mean, that's a poetic, so yeah, the buy or die was about follow up, but you made me think of that death psychologically to that. Like, would would someone that goes to so what would they follow up in the future, or or is that person, or is that person dead to them? And then are there consequences on the psyche of the salesperson? I think there are, but I'd like to know. Like, what do you think? You know, what? Why? Why do you have this viewpoint that you'd you'd want to let's say improve upon? that philosophy but yeah if whatever comes to your mind i know that was a bunch of things i just said 
in retort. Yeah, there was a few. Why, why does it matter to the audience, this, this discourse that we're having about the topic? Um, is it a reaction to pain and suffering in sales? Um, is it emotionally draining um, when you're getting spit on or said no to while you're going through sales, right? Is it part of it? And so those were some of the topics you just brought up there to, to talk through and how to, how to uh, recreate that some will, some won't, something next. So I, I would assume it would be, to, the recreation is exciting to me because I truly believe, in, and as I started to talk about with Matt White, he embodied this, and I believe from, even though it, it was uncomfortable for me to hear it, I believe that he embodied it from a positive standpoint in that context, like, okay, and it could be a sell, a bit of all, it could, it doesn't have to be either or, right? It could be a few of these different things that it could be self-protection because his feelings are hurt. It's draining. It's tiring to hear no. So when he says, so what? Move on. It's just like letting go of that pain, right? A, a, a psychological way to so what is to like, all right, I'm dumping out that bucket of negative experience and moving on next, like to get and deal properly with the next client. It also, when you're out there and you're, whether it's from the door knocking door to door or the client that you've sat with and you went through enough of those appointments or in any area if it doesn't work out, I do look at it from, from Matt's perspective that he was taking it as a positive, right? Like this was a motivational thing to him to not be tied to these negative thoughts, emotions, et cetera. Now I'm, you know, I'm psychological. You are, we're going to dig into this. What's the why, right? He wasn't as much of that way. He was a real logistical operational person, like move on. And, and we might view that as cold, right? Or let, but it's just different. We talked about this a little bit in our last podcast. Some people are just different. We were talking about, anyway, so some people are just different. They're going to view it differently. So I, I actually do, I do think it was a great concept. I am interested to work through how that would go. I want to talk about how you said the sell or die from the, from the Wolf of Wall Street. I haven't watched it, so I, don't, I haven't read it. I don't know. I know the character particularly. And if it was a motivational thing for the, from the leadership to the, to the sales staff or the, you know, stock market people, whatever they were um, to continually follow up until you get a yes or a no, that's a reasonable thing. That's a responsible thing in our business. If you're a salesperson, you should be following up until you get a end of the road, right? And if that end of the road means then you follow up again in a year from now or however your, your system for, for follow-ups are set up and then you enact the action, you execute the action. Now, again, th these two things could have this negative connotation like shutting them off, they're dead to them. And I, and I really, I think that you hit the nail on the head is it, it seems as if it's a self-protection mechanism, right? And I think that's the potentially the reason why it was so uncomfortable is as we create or paint somebody as they're just not smart enough to take what we have to offer. Well, the, the flip side of that is I wasn't able to allow them to understand enough information. I wasn't able to break through their fear, their anxiety, their busyness to create urgency, value, meaning, the reason why they should un trust me, right? Like to, to share more information. So in any, any scenario, or they just might not be a good fit, right? Like, so I think that there is a, that there's like this two sides, if, if not more. I think you, the, knowing you, I think you'd say some will, some won't. That's of this world. God bless them. Who's next? Like the interaction reveals you. The so what is like, I have succumbed. This is without being said. I have succumbed to the interaction. Like whatever the conflict was, that cross crushed me. So, so what? It doesn't matter. I'm not, you know, I don't love my enemies. I, be, I, imbi I embody whatever the suffering was that I was unable to burden. 
So I'm going to shut down a part of my spirit, like my openness. My openness. Next, I'm going to forget about it. I didn't work through anything. I've repressed it. I'm going to bring that to the next interaction and the next interaction and the next interaction. I just think that knowing you, it's like, yeah, some will on the first go around. Some won't on the first go around. All right, okay. Bless them. Mm. It's like, because the reason I mean, the, 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 the so what to me screams nihilism. Mm. You know, we should look up the definition because if the audience never heard of that, it's like meaninglessness. What, just because I didn't get what I want? This was a waste of time and space. That's not, who's that up to? Is that up to me? How would you describe nihilism if, without looking Meaninglessness. It up? like I, I think it would be up. Don't look it up. Don't look it up. Don't look it up. Hold yeah, on. Just hold me. Let me tell you. I'm on a podcast, babe. <laughs> I don't want you to look it up because I want to, I want to get, I want to get your, yeah, and I want to share, share mine too. Uh, well, I, I, from my, 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 my understanding in the 19th century, Friedrich Nietzsche in, um, yeah, yeah, you're laughing now. <laughs> yeah. I think it was the, the joyful wisdom. So it's also called the gay science. It means the joyful wisdom. He first pr pr promoted the idea that God is dead and not like, and we have killed him. Meaning like once the, once the under underlying belief structure of the culture, that monotheistic acceptance of the eternal is, 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 is gone. As, as Dostoevsky would say, anything is permissible. No, meaningless, no. meaninglessness. There's no inherent meaning, purpose. It's it's, and 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 he took it further, saying if we don't create our own values, or we have to create our own values because there's nothing undergirding our 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 existence. So, wow, what does this have to do with self? Well, I would argue that you know why would I want to knock on the next door? If I have to lie to myself to get to the next one, God, this poor person too who mentioned. I, I want to go Jungian for a second. And say people, Carl Jung. People don't have ideas. Ideas have people, and and say that whoever was the individual that was representing this idea, uh, this isn't about that person. I, I'm just giving feedback on what I think this philosophy represents or could lead to from a person to person human interaction. And I'm bringing this up because I believe that Robert Freehafer, you would say, even if you didn't say it, like how you live, I've observed you stelling. You're like, some will, some won't. God bless them. Who's next? Who, who can I meet next? Sorry. You, you want to, what do you, I know I'm going all over the place. This is an exciting topic. Who knew we'd get here? I just want to know what you were thinking about sales. So I, I think I think that you're you're on on the track with from my my perspective. I don't know the exact definition of nihilism, but my understanding is that it's a baseline of there is no we are just what we are. We are physical being with a an essence of who we are that's created or uh, that's here, right? We're just here. There's no afterlife. There's no, it's just what we have. And then it's, this is over and you're in the dirt. That's the, the foundation of it. And from that point, then you understand how big everything is and how meaningless your actual existence is in the broad um, scope of space, time, and where we are on this speck of dust flying through the universe right which is then nothingness and ultimately then i believe it leads into do what you feel is so i think the next thing is not from a negative connotation side like just do whatever kill steal murder rape pillage do whatever you want i don't think that that my under, my understanding is that denialist isn't looking at that it's like with the understanding that you're nothing this is only temporary 
that you should go after the things that are good to you and try to live, create meaning in your life's experience, right? By treating other people good and doing these things. So that's that was my understanding from somebody that shared with me. And again, I, I don't like to not, you know, give the credit where credit's due. His name was um, Matt, another Matt <laughs> from the company and uh, from Guardian. And he unfortunately has passed away. Um, but we formed a great relationship. You remember Matt with the with the angels. And uh, so so anyway, he, uh, you know, he sent me a video because we would talk about spiritual things and I would be sharing the gospel with him. And he was like, hey, let me send you this video about nihilism. And I can picture it like it was yesterday, even though it was five years ago or whatever it was, however long mm -hmm. ago. And, and it was something along those lines. And that's kind of what the nihilism was. It was, you know, like the no other created meaning. Yeah. And then to live out those things, which, which the challenge is, is that really, and I don't know the, the, I don't know the true meaning of relativism. I'm starting to understand a little bit more, but it's relative to the individual of what they consider meaning. So unfortunately with that, if murdering the person to get what you want is relative, and then you are able to be totally comfortable and confident in what you do, that's not so great, right? So we don't have this set of morals and values across the board that we're living through. So all that being said, um, I do agree that in both scenarios, what you described and what I'm describing, it is a nihilist. It does represent a nihilistic view. So what next? Like, I don't care. It's not affecting me. They're separate from me. Our interwoven lives don't matter. And, and you said it like it's going to infect impact the next relationship and the next relationship there is the the there is the chance that that could go on if somebody isn't isn't um able to you know properly process those well how do i listen if i'm closed i will tell you from my experience it's Gosh, dang uncomfortable. That's for sure. What do you it mean? It takes work when you're closed off to hear something and somebody is telling you it is uncomfortable and it takes work to not listen to it, right? Like it, it, there's emotion in there. You have to self-justify things. You have to paint them in a picture. That's my experience. Like, you know, I could go back to some of our meetings when you'd be like, write it on the board. What's this? And what are your goals? And how is this going to happen? And how does this person fit in? And what about them? And what about this? And I like might in the past and especially in the beginning, like I had my own worldview and you were like crashing into it and exposing things or asking the questions that I would then have to answer. So how do you listen when you're closed? It is freaking uncomfortable because that's the question. If you're closed to hearing it, how do you listen? Well, you, it's uncomfortable. You self-justify, you you make meaning, you judge the other person, you have uncomfortable feelings. Some people will use drugs or alcohol to avoid the reality that they are creating or not wanting to listen to those around them or face. That's my, that's like, you now I feel like I'm getting a little bit um, ambiguous with some of that, but ultimately um, then I guess the, the solution minded how do you listen when you're closed is that it would have to come from somebody that there's an assemblance of trust or that you aspire to be like based off of an external vision or what you see and then which then has to do with trust right like so so that's one way that someone could potentially listen it could be proximity whoever's close to you it could be parents family um if you chose to have an advisor right like even just the act of reaching out and asking one question is going to start because everybody's closed to some degree or some extent because, again, we're getting pretty psychological here. I believe that me and everybody else around me is closed to some extent because we all have our own paradigm, the way that we see the world. And if somebody else just sees it differently, these are some things that I'm definitely coming mm. to learn and understand that always. People are going to see stuff differently than me. 
And I've had so much attached to like having somebody see something the same way that I do. And a lot of times I want them to see me the way that I see myself, which the the paradox to that is I can't even see myself except for like right now I can see myself in Zoom, but what do I want to look at? And now for those that are listening on a podcast, we're on a video at Zoom and I can look at you or I can look at me, right? And it's that's an interesting discussion in and of itself. So how does one listen when they are closed? It's uncomfortable. The, the steps would be that they would ans- ask a question and, and uh, you know, that that would really, I think, be a, a little bit a di- a, another different and for the audience, right? How do you even know if you're closed, right? If you think you got everything figured out, you have people around you that are like an echo chamber, they're agreeing with you, especially for the entrepreneur, the person that's moving and shaking. They think like, oh, I'm talking to everybody. I'm, I'm, but if you're all hearing the same stuff over and over, do this, execute on this, make a goals list, do, you know, don't listen to people that are saying this, the they're against you, kill the haters, blah, 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 right? Like, so ask some people, right? Like that, that's your lesson. That's your lesson, Jay, right? Like listen to the people that are coming in conflict with you. Ask them a question to understand when you start, when I, when I start getting anxious, frustrated because somebody's saying something, I want to change what they're thinking. That's the second step, right? First is like, listen to them, understand them. Emotion's going to rise up, table that, think with reason, ask the people more. So really, are you even open or closed? Let's, we should make a test. Mm. How would someone even know? Because if you're more than likely, from my experience, when I was very closed minded, closed off to other people's opinions, closed off to share who I am, closed off to experiencing my own stuff, closed off from the own thoughts that I had that were better, closed off from hearing people that were close to me saying like, I don't know about this person or that person or that action or this action. And I was so focused under, I'm different. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm going after these things, right? And and that caused me some pain. So from my own experience being closed off, I did not know that I was even closed I just thought that's who I was. And this whole world is like different than me and not looking at things the same way. I see things differently. So I I jokingly, but seriously, the way that we do it, I believe that you taught me is to ask questions and then you can listen for the inconsistencies in what people say. Like even as I talk, Hmm. you or the listener can probably hear the inconsistencies in what I say and I don't even hear them or see them or know them. Then having people around you that you trust and that give a crap that will call you out like, hey, like you said this, but then you're doing this or you said this, then you said this. Which way do you mean? Not trying to bash you and hurt you, but uncover because sometimes two different things can be said and meant two different things. For an example, buy or die or some will, some won't. So what next? Um, What have been some of the positive consequences or outcomes of your business from looking at things? through this lens and if you were to take you know this conversation to the nth degree to explain the difference in that sales philosophy in the beginning of the conversation to how you approach things so what are the what are the i just want to make sure i understand the question you're saying what are the benefits in the business from an original sales minded go Get as much as you can, move on if they're not interested. Yeah, like if you can understand where you've come from and where you are in how you're leading your organization today Mm -hmm. and give the audience some context because for all they know, you're some philosopher after this conversation. Is this guy? I'm a a hustler. I'm a hustler, right? Like I I, so that's how it started. Just Going out, grinding. I, I believe that it was the the actions and attitudes of I went out, I knocked the door, I motivated, I I sold, right? I, some will, some won't. So what next? I I didn't have the words to it, but I had the action to it, and um and then in the organization it attracted because there was still me inside of there, right? There was still like the guy that wanted to honor God, that wanted to do things the right way, that wanted to be honest with people, wanted to had plans. Like my brain would just work and lay things out. And then I would hold people accountable to it, to a degree. Like, Hey, what are you doing? What's the plan? When can we get together? Let's go knock the doors. How are you going to do it? What did you do? How did you do today? Blah, 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 blah. Right. 
I would say though, and I'm still learning and practicing this, a lot of that was from a fear-based mentality. And it's that that conflict, that fear was what moved me. Fear of missing out on the storm, fear of missing out on the sales. That fear made it so I would always answer my phone. I'd never not call somebody back. I would be so over my fear that someone in the company or someone outside the company, the homeowner wouldn't do what they're supposed to. So it created this crazy amount of, like in a great way, of follow-up with everybody, like, right? But it also created distrust and challenges in the organization. People get frustrated. They call it like micromanaging, right? So I, I was doing it from a real reactive state. So it still created business, but it created a real tough relationship scenario. And I became like a little hardened. My view started to become like, oh man, nobody's living up. They're not doing these things. Judgment, excuse me, judgmental. And I really do believe that through our work and understanding, you now I did go like, and you know this, like a rubber band, like back the other way, real far, like eh, everybody just does what they do. And we just all talk about things and figure it out. And, uh, and the sales will come. And I like forgot about the drive, the money, the action that still needs to go on. And now it's been over the last like four years or so, a, a mix or three years, a mix of that, right? Because the actions can't be removed of the follow-up, the calling, the knocking, the motivation, the excitement about these things. People still need that to, um, I need it. I enjoy it. It brings extra value and meaning to this life for me, right? And and uh, so so now more recently, over the last few years, the ability to understand what needs to go on, the proactivity of setting out meetings, expectations, talking clearly with somebody rather than a fear-based re reactive thing. Um, and it's created so much more balance in my life. It's created so far, the numbers are showing that it's created success on a, um, on a continual basis for the last three years. Now, I always have the thought in the back of my mind, like, oh, is it because of that? Or is it because of other circumstances? We got nice storms or whatever these other external circumstances are. And I think it's a combination of those things. If I was still running like crazy and, you know, I, I may run all the people out of the business at that point. If truly, if we didn't connect and you didn't help me understand why culture matters and how what I was doing was actually starting to destroy the culture. And it actually, it was great. It was a catalyst. It attracted culture. And what we've talked about so many times is that then if there's not like this forward movement, forward growth on my end, you revealed how you were like a mirror. I say that often you held up to, so I could see all of my own insecurities, all the things that I was lacking in how as a leader for that level of a business as moving into, you know, managing a, a larger business and more processes, more procedures in a way to scale it. I wasn't really ready for that at all. And you really helped equip me to be able to navigate those things. Now, this is a daily practice, right? Mm -hmm. And to unpack like all the little parts that go into it, that wouldn't be reasonable in a 45 minute podcast. That's like a probably a five day seminar, right? And broken down into breakout groups and all this stuff. But but ultimately the, the change of the responsibility on my end, the proactiveness, the communication with people, listening to them, it has impacted, you know, first and foremost with me, the way that my heart and my mind in such a freeing way, like I'm not running from anxiety, guilt, resentment, you know, uh, celebration, thankfulness, like, cause that, that's was like old way. And then like, you know, so like overwhelmed with emotion because I would just move, move, move and never even like get a break or anything and then do so much busyness out of guilt versus now there's like discipline, regular activities that I go on to, looking at goals, enacting these things, having hard conversations, not kicking those things down the down the road. And, uh, and the end result is, is that, man, it, you know, you asked about it in the last part one of this podcast, what's the pictures all about? Like the, the meaning that's built through mm. these, these relationships with these humans based off of these changes is 
you know, I don't have to say which one's more valuable because I have them both. It's it's netted financial resources and experiences that, you know, I say experience is worth more personally, right? But they come together, right? I get, and they have, have impact on their life. So we talk about in the introduction, like, oh, he helps people. Like, that's true. The company helps owners. But right now I feel like my role is helping the company. And then from that point, they can help more people. So it's a, it is a, it's been a scaling opportunity with that. And, and when I say scaling, I'm not saying, oh, I got 50 sales reps right now, but going from five to 10, right? Like that's a hundred percent growth, right? But, but at the same time, it's still, it's a lot of work, right? And it's revealing other areas that mean I got to level up in this area. I have to get things more prepared in certain trainings and onboardings and processes now that I see what can be done and then rather, and I'll give you, I'll, I'll, I'll say this about how it's changed because of the work that we've done and the way that this has changed from then till now, it used to be just give people some ride alongs for training and send them out there. Then they would have questions. And then I'd insecurely, they'd be like, Oh, this happened. I'm like, Oh, did you say this, say this thing? Da, 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 da. And they would get the lesson from me, but it would be not in an organized fashion. I'd be anxious and like hurrying up and, and so much wanting to answer their questions. So they don't ever mess anything up ever. We don't get a bad name. Nothing goes, there's no miscommunication between them and a homeowner. And it would create a lot of anxiety for me and urgency. And, um, and I've been recognizing that with newer sales reps coming on. It's something that throughout all different area of my life, I, I'm recognizing this thing right now. And I re- and it also is a good thing, right? Same thing. It, it propels me to do things, respond to people, get stuff done. But I believe my theory is that through this recognition and awareness and openness, if I am able to be proactive in these certain things, which I'm going to talk about in a second, that I'll still have the same end result of success. People coming along board, um, they have success, impact their lives, impact a bunch of homeowners, make profits, be able to give, like all these good things will go on. But through the process, instead of creating a lot of like trauma, guilt, rough feelings, I could have this like real awesome experience. That's my that's my theory, which I've been able to enact a little bit. And the biggest thing, and I'll tell you an example just from today. So we have these new sales reps that are on and, you know, they're, they're moving along. The process is working. They're, they're succeeding. And one of them over the weekend was like, I got this, you know, insurance scope for a homeowner. Now I got to go sign a final contract and I could feel it so much because I want him to get the business. I, it is to me, it's monumental when that sales rep sells their first job, like all the work that they've done for five weeks or six weeks, it comes to fruition. Like, the knocking on all the doors, the meeting the adjusters, doing the things. And they, ha- they have stuff in their pipeline, but they have no inked contract yet. So he's like, oh, I want to do this. And I'm like, I could feel it inside texting on Friday night before the 4th of July weekend. I have commitments to do other things, but I have to like make sure that I'm tending to them at this point, tending to that sales rep. And uh, I could feel it. So I was like, all right, what do I do here? So now this is some... Um, reactive proactivity that I'm going to describe here, but it's better than reactivity. And it's training me and teaching me about how can I then take this new level of business that I'm in and make it more proactive. But so rather than be like, oh, handle this right now. I've been, I I set a meeting for this morning. I invited the four brand new sales reps. I said, we're going to do a training from 8.30 till 9.30 to go how to do a final agreement with a homeowner. And I, and I had John help me print out all the paperwork that we need, get everything ready. And we did a training and the training was recorded. So now it's, it's already in mix. They can watch it over and over again. They can self-educate, ask questions about it. So that is to me, the direction that I'm going. Now Mm. I'm aware. All right, I have to create a proactive training protocol where they go out, they see it from a couple sales reps, they understand what goes on in the field, they watch the videos with me, I do it with them one time, and then they do it back to me. Now, the other thing that I found proactively is that every little part of my business, there's a lot that goes into each meeting. And I need to reduce it down to the ridiculous. Like, okay, here's this one little statement, break it down to a five minute video so they understand it. And they literally memorize those words for that portion. And I make sure that they send it back to me. So these are some concepts and ideas that come from a proactive stance of what it was like before to long answer of your question to what is going on now. 
And that is going to be the thing that I believe through this proactive, disciplined nature to be able to then go in and do that work, not be distracted with other things, a million different fires, handle, let those things get handled by the people that they should, not put my nose into everybody's business. Oh, what's going on here? What's going on here? Blah, blah, blah. And just handling what I need to in a proactive state. So I know that's a long answer to what's the difference, but there's a lot and it's impactful personally, financially, the business life, so many things are going on from that change from the before mindset to the current mindset of how to run how to run this business in sales. Are, are the sales growing? Yes. Yes. Is that weird? I won't say it's weird. Um, what I will say is that there is something inside of me right i'm an emotional guy i'm a psychological guy like the first the first book that i share with every rep that's even interested is psychological psychology of sales right like that's how i live that's how i look at it so weird it's no it's not weird i'm, I'm trying to think about maybe surprising is what i meant no, because I've been because we've been working together long enough. And now through the implementation of other things, I've seen the end result. So I'm not surprised because you've prepared me for the fact that once these actions go on and you live them out long enough, there will be results. It's exciting. It's exciting. And it's and it, you know, it was a remote, it was for me this year was like a marking time period. It was. 10 there was it was uh 10 years well actually last year was like 10 years right like all right this has been going on for 10 years and um so that coupled with then regular sales coming through and it's been one thing after the other that has been like you said all right do this 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 is going to happen do this 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 is going to happen so after listening to you for long enough and you describe what's going to go on it's not surprising that it happens what it is is exciting and also it's fuel it fuels me for more of doing those actions and activities because if that can go on in this amount of time and we're able to, and God willing, right? Because that's going to be in His hands with how this moves forward. I don't want to sit over here on this side mm. of the this side of the microphone and say like I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. I'm going to show up and I'm going to do the actions. But the end result, if it works out and God wills this to go on, there is a high probability. Like so, I'm starting to accept the reality that this could be twenty sales reps next year. It could be open up a division in Maryland with another five next year and then 10 the year after that. So it could, it could systematically grow now based off of systems. And it's not only systems. So I don't want to get stuck on that, like processes and systems and, and things, but it's the relationship. It's actually creating the relationships with the guardians that are then going to embody or have alignment with the values that I have that I'm able that I've you know you've helped me put the values on the wall the missions the goals the beliefs right all the purpose the vision so then when this is utilized through every day through the meeting through the symbolism through the language right of what we do through the training through this through the support of culture through the individuals that it's really just coming to fruition right so it's not no, it's not weird. What's your advice to people listening to this that think, uh, well, I, I got the values. I, I invested in someone to come in and put them put them together, uh, but it's not really doing anything. Like, how have you brought them to life? I think you're an ideal person to ask that because I think you really have brought them to life. Like, what's your advice to someone listening to this that's invested? In so that, here's, here's one thing that I do, right? They're on the wall, right? They're literally on the wall in the conference room. So sometimes if I'm in, an off, in a meeting in my office or I'm in a meeting somewhere and they're on the wall in other people's offices too, the ones that I chose to go on their walls. Um, I will pick somebody up, like, come with me, come with me. This is it right here. Here's our scenario that we're going through. Here's the value. 
A guardian listens intentionally, communicates clearly, and educates the customer by telling the truth. Here's the scenario, right? Like we have to tell them, you want to listen to them to understand where they're at. This is where you may have missed the ball. You didn't listen to them, right? They really said to you, blah, blah, blah. And then you had to communicate clearly by telling the truth. It's hard. This is a hard statement that you have to make. So literally, physically taking somebody into the room and showing them this through this last um hiring phase all the way intentionally all the way down on one side of the conference room is the missions beliefs values purpose or purpose and yeah so and on the other side of the wall is guardian right the g-u-a-r-d-i-a-n and that's all the values laid out so even as the point when a sales rep or a guardian is coming in for a an appointment say it's one o'clock for their first interview in person, we sit them at one side of the table. We have a pen and paper there. We have a cup of water there. So this is where they sit. You know, when Lydia meets them at the door, it's okay, sit them there. If they're early, they sit there. They literally have nothing to do but stare and read those things. We, pr I'll purposely stop in at one o'clock and say, I'm going to be right in in just a couple of minutes. And I'll go away just for a cup. If they show up right at one, if they show up early, then I'm coming in there at one because they've had 10 minutes already to, to look at the wall and read it. And then through the interview, we ask questions that were built around those values. And we use that as an opportunity while we're interviewing, while I'm interviewing someone, when they're talking about it, I say, oh, that's really interesting because this is right here. We think long, not with our own selfish desires, but we think long-term. I'm really glad that you expressed that that way. People always, we ask questions. They talk about like, oh, what's important? How's it? Oh, well, yeah. So that's, that's great because attitude is very important and we go into it. So all that being said, it starts with utilizing the language, but it's not, but here's the great thing. You helped me create that. You, 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 it was a done for you thing. You created it by being around me, by in, immersing yourself in the company to write, mm -hmm. but it didn't come to me like that right it's not like i just started off doing that it was the action of living it and then being held accountable by the word that's around me even now to this point where people will ask me oh does that live up to that that value if really really doing something doing these things and so yeah we're and we use it when we have to make decisions we're looking at that like all right well how does this align with this so so to to use it to talk it if you said to me right now, what's every single one memorized? I don't have that. But, you know, I just realized we went to a convention for a supplier this past week and, and there was a coach there that was talking about mission and how it needs to be useful and utilized with utility, not just on the wall. And uh, I was like, man, like I really got to go back and memorize all of these because the memorization of it is important because then I could easily pull from it. And if I'm not going to memorize it, how could others? And then we, I went into that from that conflict the internal conflict I was like all right creation so how do i do this what am i going to do to motivate others in the industry in my company to memorize them and understand the application because they are living it out but if they don't know the word and then start to utilize it in their decision making it will not be as impactful so that would be the the so recommendation is one write it Write it down what it is, what your values are, what your vision, your mission, your purpose, your goals. Then from that point, um, utilize it, have it out so you can see it, pull from it. And if you have to revise it, revise it to what's what's new, right? What do you find out? And then use it through all of your processes, all of the things that you do. Utilize that in your discussions. And I'm the visionary, right? I'm the CEO. I'm the founder. So if I'm not utilizing it in my word, in the the message I'm sending out to the reps, through the to the company, through the through social, through all the different mediums that we communicate today, then how could I ever expect it to be anything more? And then to live it out, and then use it to say, all right, yeah, this is how I live this out. But this is how this ties back to what this value is, because not a lot of people can equate those two things. They just say, oh, you just do that like that. And this is how you do that. But the more and more that I found with the sales reps that we circle back to that, especially the new hires, we circle back, oh, this is why we do this. They're bringing it back to me now. Like within months, they're like, oh yeah, that makes sense because of this, this value. So wow. uh, that's how I would propose. And I'm still learning. I'm literally in this process and it's taken me time. The other thing would be don't 
don't give up. You got a lot of stuff going on more than likely if you're running a business, but these disciplined actions of, of continual doing it will, will create um, results. It just may take some time. Um, yeah. How long do you think it, it really takes to align the culture to get it to, you know, I don't even want to use that word. Cause I, I, I think often I, I think uh, the idea of the, the alignment is like uh, it's about control implicitly. Uh, yeah, I figured come to that conclusion within the last few years. Um, and I don't want to say create because creating a culture is what they did with communism and, you know, North Korea is a good example of creating a culture, but maybe revealing the character of the operating principle, <laughs> right? Revealing who you are, revealing the va- revealing the truth in a sense, like the values. Um, you know, I think there's some ultimate values like forgiveness seems like pretty fundamental. <laughs> but yeah, I guess what my question is, how long does it take How long do you think it takes to get it to where actions taken, but not out of, not out of, the fear and anxiety that you're that you were alluding to earlier, but more out of a meaning and a responsibility. Like, how long do you think that? takes and i of course you know you can answer this anecdotally with your own experience but i i i don't just like not just that way you know try what 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 do you think you know even outside of yourself like if you put yourself into some of your you know peers colleagues friends like how long do you because i'm still figuring this out like how long does it take for that balance to occur for some of that wants it to occur because theoretically i think it, you, you can actually get the cult done faster if we work hard enough angry enough and name call enough we can actually get a business to make more money faster i just don't think the juice is worth the squeeze so no you know i didn't even listen to this that, i'm not your guy we're not your people and that's why I'm asking this. It's like, I, I think actually you can get a company to produce results faster if you work like crazy, you do all the things like speak, sell, market, spend money, do nothing else but work and name call as much as possible. I, I think a business can can grow faster that way. So I, you know, I, I, maybe I muddled the water a bit with my own viewpoint, but I think like, yeah, or maybe maybe you, you would disagree. Maybe Jay, no, it can be done faster the, the, the this way. But yeah, ha- first question is how long do you think it takes to do to experience to to experience to evolve into where you're at in your leadership? If 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 you were in like you said, one side of the one side of the equation to the other side. Right. One was like really fear and anxious, and the other was like lax, lackadaisical. And then you're saying now you now you believe you're in a much in in in, in a what would you say? What word? Do you say like um a combination? More disciplined. I, I understand there needs to be actions and, and excitement that's added to it. You do you do need to focus on the win as well. And um and accountability. Yeah, so how long you think that? So, here, so, so here's the thing, you know, I know you said, oh, try not to answer it from your own view. I really only have my own view, right? And here's the, the, the exciting part to that question. And here's where it becomes, I won't say a paradox, but it's going to be revealing. It took a long time for me. I think it took a long time, even though when we look back at it, it's like, oh, 18, 18, 19, or say 19, 18 to 19. 20, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. We got five years, right? Like it's just a short time. That's a long time. Some business might not even, might not even withstand for five years, right? So now for me, that it does really reveal a tough question. Like, well, well why? Well, because I'm messed up. 
I was in, I was a traumatized human that what we did together was revealing how closed I was to the way that I viewed the world. And, you know, this, I love this about our relationship is that you as a non professing, you're not professing faith. You're not saying like, this is faith and this is what it is as somebody that is trying to live morally and ethically through what you believe as if there is God, you were able to reveal to me my lack of faith as someone that is out there professing like God, salvation, eternity, and how my actually lack of faith was impacting. By the way, I just want to, I do want to challenge. I don't think I've ever, I don't think you ever, ever not a faith. I, I, I don't, I, I was, okay. We all live in contradicting a varying degree, but if anything, I'm going to make you stop. You're a faith. I'm going to make you stop. You're trying to say right now that I think that you think that I didn't have faith. No, what I'm saying is no, no, through my I'm... work with you, it was revealed that my actions were based off of my insides that were not being faithful. I wasn't being, I was being fearful, the yeah. opposite of trusting God. Right. So I was like, dang, man. So so it took me a long time to recognize that part. It also took me a long time to be okay to make moves, right? To make changes because now that was revealing of me and my culture. I'm not just cutting people. And not that that was your recommendation, like, oh, just cut everybody. But you would ask questions that inside of me was like, oh, man, like if I just let make these hard changes, then maybe things would have moved quicker. I don't know this, right? I'm not sure because I only have my own view to look at, but I would say that if somebody has a solid advisor and I would consider you a solid advisor that would lead them and they would ask the questions and they would come to those determinations and they would be ready and willing to do the hard work from an ethical and moral standpoint that it could be done significantly faster. Now, the other thing is that you're growing and learning as years have gone by, right? So you're gaining, if you look at it, you, you read 271 books a year or whatever the number is. So in five years, that's like over a thousand additional books and things that have gone into your brain. So you're, and then you have experience with me. So now you can pull from that experience and then see like, oh man, this person is maybe a little bit slower to move in action. And you could share like, hey, this is going to be a longer path for you to get to here. These are some things you could do and give them advisement on those type of things. So that being said, um, I think, and, and I, I like when you stopped yourself about like, oh, how long to align the culture? Because truly that, and through the reading of the, of the, you know, hardback book that you created just for me as a culture partner. And I go page by page by page, paragraph by paragraph. Um, again, slow, right? I'm a slower mover, I believe, than others potentially. So that being said, it it was a reminder that the, the culture is always going to be redefining itself through me, right? Like, so my culture is different than it was 12 years ago and 10 years ago. There's some things that are threads through it, but the way that I'm interacting with people is going to change. And I'm, I'm seeing it. I'm hopeful that it's for the better, right? And I may get revealed to new things. So the culture is always changing. Then as I grow, there's more people that are coming in to get aligned, to come into some level of alignment. So that whole mindset of like how long to get the culture aligned, well, that would assume that there's this, you know, end result where it's all aligned, which you you did kind of say like, nah, I don't see it that way. But it's a continual, it's a it's a growing organism, right? That as it grows bigger, there needs new medium, which is what you wrote in in the in your book, right? Like that you gave it to me that then the the leader, I this is the I'm, I'm referencing the the part where you said that the leader, which is me in this scenario will um which will as the group grows better and i become a better leader and the group grows and becomes better the guardians i'm going to be challenged to be a better leader 
things will naturally change. If I go from five sales reps, I'm going to go to five guardians. I'm going to go to 10 guardians. I might have to communicate differently with them. I might have to have a weekly meeting or whatever, a, a zoom meeting with them. I might have to do things differently. And if I don't, then I'm actually falling backwards and I'm not the appropriate leader for them. So I didn't need to reach out to advisors, different technology. Oh, and, and I, I would argue that, uh, there will be those that, I mean, think about it. Imagine a system, what, what type of system would have to be in an operation for a mentee that's gotten the world from a mentor to not, to not leave the system if it's their destiny. Like it's, how could it be up? Like, how could it be? How could it be up to us as the operating principle of an equity? The fate of our people. Like meaning, you know, let's say someone, a guardian comes up the ranks. From infant to adult. And it's the perfect situation. They may want to spread their wings, meaning they may become your biggest competitor. See, it's my theory that, or my, not my theory, that's a bit arrogant, I think. My observation and speculation that how they leave, because they're going to, like it's an inevitability in, a, in an open system for people to leave like physically you've done everything you can you've even you've even grown forever like how could we know what what could it be a hundred percent of people are going to stay I, I don't i don't see how that reality could be a be a constant no matter what we did so let's say that it wasn't right let's say there's you know a point zero 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 one percent of the best employees you ever had leave how they do I think has consequences on the culture. I mean, let's say they leave in a terrible way because it's, it's, so, it's so painful to lose them. You love them. I would argue that psychologically that would be an interaction of closeness. So like you, you, you love them so much, now you hate them and now you sue them. Mm. I would argue that the person that sues them that wins that lawsuit is more likely to be attracted subconsciously to someone more someone dominant of them. Example, the next customer, the biggest customer of their life is living and breathing embodiment of that same resentment. Mm. Like they're going to eventually pay for how they interacted with that former mentee. They're eventually going to pay for whatever is in their heart, whatever's in their behavior but the one that that interaction evolves in a constructive possibility oriented honest or you know value revealing interaction they're going to see that wolf in sheep's clothing that's going to be some of their fruit Meaning the wolf and sheep's clothing would be clothing would be that next relationship that's higher in the dominance hierarchy, the power structure. So that would be like the you know there are the, uh, example you have uh, uh, customer A and customer B. They're both the same size. They both can change your entire business based on how we interacted with that mentee that left. Will increase will will attract us to A or B. A is a benevolent customer. They, they, they represent power on a level we've never been able to ascertain and they represent virtue in its open, evolving, you know, essence, let's say. Then customer B, they represent power, what we desire in this world. However, they're closed, you know, relative to the, content to the if we compared the two so what what inevitably could happen 
I would argue that the person that interacted with that mentee that was inevitably going to, you know, that employee that was inevitably going to leave, they, they have a, their own fate. Yeah, the employer can increase or decrease the likelihood of that happening or not. But can they, can they, can they, can they have 100% control over it? How could they? How they interact with that employee and that leaving will, in, will increase or decrease the likelihood of them being attracted to the protagonist or the antagonist, whether that's the uh, customer, maybe investor, uh, other types of employees, like other people, basically. So, so turnover is healthy, is, is kind of where I'm going with this. In an open system, turnover is a healthy is healthy because in closed systems, they have no turnover. In closed, meaning, you know, when you leave North Korea, they kill your family. Like that's a closed system. Um, you know, there's a stark difference between a cult and a culture. And I would argue they're not equal. So uh, anyway, that that's that's a thought that comes to mind. It's like, you could do the best thing. You, you could grow. It's, it's it, despite your growth, you may have the opportunity, like growth isn't like, what you know versus what they know, uh, how you lead versus how they lead. You've done such a good leading, such a good job as an employer leading an employee that they leave you. Now, what's the benefit of them leaving you? Well, first of all, it's not about the benefit because that's the fruit. That's not up to you. How you re relate to them is reveals you. But here, I'll give you some fruit. If you want fruit, they're going to tell the world who you are. Yeah, now they own your biggest competitor and they have no bad blood. Like it's love. I'll give you an example of this. BlackRock and Blackstone came from the same company. The Because uh, Blackstone, I believe, which is uh, run by... I don't remember the gentleman's name, but they they managed trillions of of, of dollars. And BlackRock, Schwartzman started that. Blackstone, David Schwartzman started BlackRock with a partner. And by the way, I might have gotten the two names confused, but just one of them was uh, the seed capital. Like it was started off of one, the other. And the ownerships, I would argue, hubris led to that split. And what did they lose? They lost the world. <laughs> whether, whether it stayed or eventually went off, spun off, they would have had more market share, more shareholder value had, had it gone differently. And I've seen that happen again and again and again. That's not where the thought came from. It came from a bunch of other things. But um, it's, I would argue the fruit is if you have an employee that leaves you and the character, the combination of both characters leads to a constructive dialogue and a quality relationship, I would argue that overall the brand will gain equity in the long term. And I would argue that it will lower the likelihood of attracting the types of customers that you wouldn't want to have to interact with uh, and employees and partners. and you know, Because how could it not? We're going to, you know, you know, if we're the wolf, we see a sheep and it's a wolf. If we think we're the, wolf, the sheep, God, and then we think we're the shepherd, then we're really in trouble. Oh yeah, I'm a shepherd. No, you're a wolf. Mm. And you're going to be a sheep to a bigger wolf. That's kind of where I'm going with this. Like, I, that's my um, interpretation of business dynamics. That yes, I agree with what you said from a content standpoint. If you continue that race, people are going to be attracted to learning from you and with you. But even the best pupils they will outshine the master. And how that happens will reveal the culture once again. Because if you kill them, you've lost the whole point. And God, what, what, a, uh, what a curse that is. Now you can kill them and get a lot. You, remember, you don't need to go. Anyone listening to this does not need to get their culture right 
to make a bunch of money. In fact, it, it likely could, like if I would argue, if, if <laughs> it can be done faster with more sin. Sex, drugs, and rock and roll attracts people. And, you know, you pump up those numbers. Somebody's going to buy, somebody's going to buy that product, that service, if it's quality. Um, and Rob, I don't think you've gotten slow. It's just, uh, it's a, you're just an unbelievable character. But uh, if you think you can get gone faster, I'm not going to take that away from you. But I do think it's, a, it's, it's from what I, you know, it takes time to, to, to reveal a culture, to, to reveal the potential of the leader of an open system is how I'll put it. I haven't quite gotten to the point where I could say this in a simple way. Um, and I think you are that. I mean, it, this, yeah, this was a joy. I guess, what should we talk about next time, you think? Well, hold on. I needed time to retort to some of those things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so, so um, first, first and foremost, it's interesting that the theory that you have, um, the concept that you have, that the business or the leader based on the, the, the way that they navigate within the relationship when the employee leaves and becomes its competition, that then the employer will be motivated to go. I'd like to understand that a little bit more. I can under, I think I can see it, but I'd like to maybe hear some examples or things. And I'm not saying right now, but I'd like to, to under, cause I don't disagree, but I also don't have a lot of experience. I've seen different areas where people left and how that went and things that went on. And I've had my own experiences in that scenario from both ways. And um, so I have my, my world. Yeah, the general, the, the central theme there is anything other than forgiveness and interaction would be negating of the self, negating of the culture. I agree. I agree with that. I think I'm mostly interested in how the heck then the, the leader would then go, why they would go, which it makes sense because they're carrying, to me, they're, the leader is then carrying guilt from the way that they navigated the other employee leaving so because well, then for not for that them to not feel the guilt they have to self-deceive at a level where and they'd have to take action in a level where they were not thinking and there's yeah. consequences to not think like destroying one's interpersonal life right separation from not only the eternal but like i would argue the order matters like separation from parents siblings family children spouse complete separation like right there's no integration interpersonally like i said you can yeah so so that's what i would say and and you you know you don't need to have integration of the self and to have a prosperous business it, it, <laughs> so that, so even to shed some we talked about this even when i when i had left the company that i worked with and it was uncomfortable i i it did seem like each time anybody left, they was like, all right, cut them off of Facebook, do this, separate them out. They're dead to us. Um, not yeah, there. very normal behavior, you know. And, and not, I had to not navigate crazy that, for that as the person that was getting cut off. And my view was like, man, I've been there. I stuck it out. I didn't leave. I, I, I rode all the way through. And um, and I would say from a from a receiver of that action. So this goes both ways. Right. Even the person that's leaving, if the the organization they're leaving, if the leader like bashes them, handles it poorly, they still have an opportunity of how they're going to navigate themselves. Right. And from my view, it was, hey, no need to get into that. I'm going to go out and tell everybody what how everything went. Whole thing. So I handled it. And then how many years later, like nine years later, 10 years later, I got a call out of the blue like, hey, you're a good man. You run a good company. Wow. You always did good by me. So, and I, and I really appreciate it. It, it meant a lot to me because there was weight to carry the things that I did after, you know, the, what was said to me uh, when I left. And I, and I want to be cautious because um, mm. even in this medium right now, talking about this, it could be dis, it could be viewed as um, bashing the person that let that uh, when I left. No, I, yeah, I don't think you are. What you're what I am saying, and I want to be heard on this thing, is that in the right amount of timing, that good man that I believed in and knew he was a good man and worked around him, 
in time was able to say, hey, you know, I made a mistake. I said some things. I apologize. And you're a good guy. You did just good. Da, 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 da. So we hold responsibility on both sides of this. And due to the like, and who knows what would have happened, because I don't know, you know, supposedly what would have happened if I did this or that. But potentially, if I would have then bashed him all over the place, said bad things to him, there's less ever of a probability that he would come back and say, you're a really good guy. <laughs> right? Like, so holding on to moral that ethics value, it's not always comfortable and easy. Yeah, the person's forgiveness would have to be. Or you say, you get spit on, you get this, you get this. How do you navigate it, right? And um, so so all that being said, I think there's responsibility on both parties with the way that, that transformation happens. I did want to say also that in this, through this medium of meeting with, with guardians quarterly, reviewing their individual goals quarterly, and then making a plan quarterly of what they're going to do and how they're going to do it. I had a meeting today with an amazing young man, and his name is Tyler. And we went, we spent four hours, and, and he's been he's been a, I look at Tyler as a, uh, he's been an example of this new culture, came in, trained under that, went out, and he is like a, he is amazing. He sold almost a million bucks in his first year, or right around, right around a million. Um, and through the meeting today, one wow. of his goals was to, you know, self-improvement, you know, and one of the lines was um, top performer in my field. And, and I was like, okay, what does this mean to you? And when he was explaining what it means to him, I got to hear it in his voice, the words that he used. He's like, well, you know, I really want to be good. Like, you know, I want to be good like this person or, or, you know, kind of good like this. But he was like saying a few things that I that I picked up and I asked him like, yo, are you saying that to tend to how I'm going to feel like you don't want to hurt my feelings by saying you want to be the best in your field? And he was like, yeah, because I don't remember the exact words, but he basically said like, you know, I want to really do good. I want to kind of do it like you. I'm not saying I'm going to be better than you, like something like that. And, and ultimate, and I really, I yeah. call them out. Like first I said, are you saying that because of me and how I would feel if you would say, I want to be better than you. And I did it in a, in a very interesting way. I said, what's that line say right there? Like you say that. And he was like, I want to be the top performer in my field. I was like, say it again. I want to be the top performer in my field. Say I want to be the best. Say this and look me in the face. I want to be better than you. Because I want to, and he was like, yeah, I, w- I want him to do better. And I told him, I said, you're younger than when I started. You're taking all the information that I have after 15 years of doing this, and I'm giving it to you so you can be better, faster. I said, but I got an edge on you. I've been doing this for already 15 years. So we're moving along and we're in different roles at this point. So I want that for you, Tyler. I want you to be the best. You don't have to look for my feelings, this and that. And and even to the point where it was like, because he said like, oh, I want to represent. I want to do great. I want to work for a great roofing company. And I could hear him say like, and I want to, I want to work with Guardian. It's a great company. So I even, I even let him know. I was like, look, at some day, you may be so awesome and I may be doing what I'm doing and you might see things to change your need that there might be a better roofing company for you to work for in the future. I don't want that to be. I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that we're doing the best when I listen to you and navigate this. But at the end of the day, you need to be number one. That's the guardian that I want to I mm. want to encourage in you that you're not going to settle and, and for me or, or living up to somebody else's that's a top performer expectation. You're going to be you because you're, you're, you're your own create. God created you. And you're going to pull from me, from the other top performers in here. And if you limit yourself to what I am, that will, that will be a limiting thing. There's new information, new technology, new stuff. And if you do what you say you're going to do, go to conventions, listen to this stuff, go to public speaking things. Like if you do all these things, you can be better than me, right? And so that, that so in essence, with what we're talking about here, like somebody move on, do I want to create the best? Do I want to be impactful? in working with Tyler and having him be the best that he can be? Absolutely. Does that run a risk that I might not be a good suitable, you know, mentor for him at some point or company for him to work? That does run that 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 risk. But if I would be saying, oh, I only want to teach him so much so he could only do so mm-hmm. good. 
that would be a self-fulfilling negative prophecy on me and my company because we'll only do so good. So this mindset, I believe that I have of helping him to be the best that he can be is only going to then make me better. It's going to realign my culture to be better based off of the people that are working inside the organization. So that being said, I agree with what you're saying about like, hey, you, some people will leave and move on. If that is the case and I'm able to impact him, obviously we're making money along the way, right? So the goal is being there and what a better testimony. Now, what I do for the company, like you said, what I do have written down with a big star on it on all my notes as we go through the meeting is, and I've said it, I've laid it out for certain areas and this is where I'm growing as a leader, steps to success. Hmm pathway i i've done it so much with the clients this is what it's going to be this yes. is the way. this is how we do this but ultimately i need to lay this out because if there isn't a pathway a clear line of success for the guardian if it's tyler let's say and he wants to run he wants to manage people he wants to run a territory he wants to run a branch he wants to have a franchise or whatever these things could be there's if i don't have an opportunity for him how could I even be surprised if he wants to leave and go somewhere that does have or make his own opportunity to utilize his skill set to the highest level? So that's the now, and you said it that with the depending on the you know the CEO the 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 person that owns the um, you use words like equity or something like that like the you know the yeah. person that runs the company that if they're the, the probability to keep somebody based off of their actions can be up or down. So that's where I come. That's yeah, yeah, I that's that's the I, the operating principle has to yeah. operate, meaning yeah. a lot of people that I've observed in the marketplace, ultimately, they don't want to work. And that's revealed in what they do daily. So the likelihood that they're going to lose amazing, like competent, strong-willed ambitious people is very high because it's the law of the picture people see what people people do what people see right they, they watch and so they have to and if the operating principle if their job description changes because the equity evolves and they can't be seen the way they used to be seen then they need to explain and explain and explain where are we going why are we going there how how are we going there and and do what you're talking about meet with them and get clear on the plan and help them aim to that. And it's a constant conversation. The, the smaller the organization, the more important that physical, you know, selling, the selling never stops because the, the who we're selling changes. Um, but yeah, that's just, but I know if you want to add on to, or, you know, outline that, that's kind of where we should do this right into like a part three. Yeah. What we're now that so that that being said, that I think it is a, a decent time. We we laid up on our calendar till seven fifteen with, and that was supposed to be a forty five minute podcast and a forty five minute catch up. Can't, can't do that with you, my we're, friend. This was we're doing it. Good. We're doing the catch up as we're doing yeah. it. that. That's the, that's my goal too. In this is that you know it doesn't need to be like on camera, off camera, right? Like these are the things that we talk about. This is who we are. Um, so or on record, off record. Now there's certain things that pretty cool not the right medium to talk about in this context but um you know all these all these things what are your are, final thoughts for our well audience? my final thoughts going to go back to our opening statement it's so hard to believe what is it so hard to believe what is that last word it is so hard to obey because because it's so hard to obey is yeah. it because that's the word yeah is that the quote yeah it's yeah so care for believe because it's so hard to obey. Yeah. It's so hard to believe. Now, the context you know? is the eternal. So it's hard to believe in, in spiritual, eternal, eternally creator, God type of mindset. My, my speculation is that's what, <laughs> that's what Kierkegaard was, was alluding to. And I, I picked that thought it'd be the perfect quote. It's so today. hard to believe because it is so hard to obey that is it that 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 really works on on multiple you know just it, if you're not obeying on a daily basis if you're not being obedient it's going to be hard to believe 
right? Like from a spiritual mindset, if I'm going out and I'm cheating, lying, stealing, you know, doing the things like it's really, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be hard for me to believe my actions are not in alignment with what I would believe if I believed it. So it's so hard to believe. Yeah. How can you have faith if you're living in sin? And then uh, this is where I think the challenge is to the believers. It's like, if you don't forgive the person that is unable to forgive because they're stuck in that paradox, well, then what happens next? Well, hell, essentially, because that's the paradox of tolerance. The more tolerant we are, and tolerance is different than forgiveness, redemption, like forgiveness as a qualitative, interactive, exercising essence of redemption of someone that's stuck in that paradox the paradox of tolerance is the more the 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 more tolerant we are to intolerance intolerance rises up destroys us and itself so we have to obey in our forgiveness you have to love your enemies and if you're unable to meet them where they are and learn listen tell the truth be willing to suffer and then die for the their their destiny then 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 you're not being obedient you're not living the 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 values you preach and basically you're just going to get destroyed by intolerance anyway that's where i'm at in the whole (laughs) i didn't think about any of this when when i picked that quote but but now i'm thinking about it because you brought it up again so i really appreciate you Uh, we could do a whole episode just on that because so so with with that being said a key word i think in that statement is because right like it's so hard to believe. It's so hard to obey. Like, which which one is which one's the chicken or the egg? Which one's coming first? It's hard to believe because we can't obey because we are sinful people, right? And so then it's hard to believe. Well, someone that's fallen, like literally, may need to conceptually, you know, it's almost like you've fallen down, both of your knees are on the ground, and conceptually you need to you know say out loud your belief to to get like your hand on another person's leg or you know to get up basically like you, you and others may have a different path in that i don't know i i, I have no idea I, i'm just it's thinking a very, it's a very as i even listen to you and think about the statement it's a very so spoken from a man of faith and my understanding of faith is that it's saying it's so it's so hard to believe because it's so hard to obey so if you focus on the belief right like so from a faithful concept you know this this belief again in in god like and and i'm using as an absolute like to believe in god right like that what comes first right it does go around and around like Due to the fact, like my, so I'm going to speak from my perspective as a Christian man, the whole basis of the faith is that I'm a man from the very beginning, from Genesis, and I've separated myself from God based off of my sin, right? And that can, all kinds of stuff can fall into there, but just, so I'm separated, I, I didn't obey and I still don't obey God to the fullest. So that's, that's the faith. And then that God loves us so much that he sent his son to take all the punishment that I have, all the, the re- responsibility for my sin. So I don't have to pay that punishment. I could live with him in eternity and have that faithfulness that experience with him now. It's just it's it's tough because I I think I'd like to read a little bit more around. Well, I that. think the nihilist, the useful nihilist, may be obeying their own creed. Listen, if I understand how to navigate the matrix and get all the power I want, because I'm just overwhelmingly valuable to people because of how I relate to them, then eventually I'm just going to become a demagogue unless I give glory to something outside of myself because it's all self-glorification and i'm going to end up drowning in the opportunities that come to sin from my virtue like i thought like many steps ahead right of this whole deal you know success and all this stuff 
And you don't really know what you're made of until you're getting offered the world every day on a platter and there's no consequences. And how do I know that who I'm going to be when I have that offering will not be different based on the, not only the offering, but the journey and the impact of that much power in this world. And that's what I think about a lot. It's like, huh, you know, at, at some point, I don't think I'd be able to be the, the best version of the self that I think I could be or the best or the most qualitative, constructive, you know, revealing of, of what I perceive goodness to be alone. Like, I, I don't think I'm strong enough to think that or, or, or to do that or to live that. And if I do, then I will definitely will likely fail. So I'm, you know, I don't know, but maybe this is like, let me write wait, this. Wait, wait, wait. So let me, okay. before you end, because I know we that gotta, we're going to go towards ending. So I want to say this, is that when you say that, that I believe is truthful, like that you're you're probably going to fail. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to do things that are outside of your alignment because we're human, right? So the one thing to, 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 to backtrack a little bit in regards to faith and how, how my, my faith and, and God through faith in Jesus and the fact that I get God's spirit, the spirit of God to live inside of me and give me strength and give me conviction and give me the ability to say no to that sin. I still have free will. I can still say yes and do it. Um, but I wanted to bring up this point of, with that being said, I believe that you will have a higher probability of saying no to the sin while you're successful when you put your faith in Jesus Christ and call out to him as your savior for your current and past sins that then the Holy Spirit will enter into you and give you this strength and awareness to do even better what I believe you've been able to do on your own white knuckling strengths because you do, like I said, you've lived these things out through a desire and of you wanting to live virtuously. That is amazing. That being said, something that generally comes up when we talk about faith and we talk about living it out and being obedient, you often bring up forgiveness. You say it over and over. You bring up forgiveness. That, that is the way that we will act out like faith or this this virtue that we have is to truly forgive others around us right like and it's this thing that is so attractive to you and you desire to do and you think that if we and you talk so much about how we 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 don't forgive or we live in this under, thinking that we do forgive but we're not actually forgiving we're tolerating you know so many different areas that you talk about with forgiveness and um that's a very meaningful word for me because I, I don't know that. So I don't know what the level that you can forgive I, inside your heart and your mind and how to live and act that out. But what I can tell you is what goes on inside of me and I give it supernatural credit. I give the credit to God. When I think of what this cross symbolizes on my neck what God the Father Creator has done through sending his son in the flesh like me to live this sinless life. He loved me. He loved all of us, even while we were sinners and while we were doing and while I still am going to. And he's taken the punishment on as a way and forgiven me. And I believe it. Like that's the faith. That is like the crux of faith. It says that, you know, so. Rather than quoting scripture, this crux of my faith is that I cry out like, please forgive me. Like, please give me another chance. Please let me be with you. Right. Like, and it can happen on a, a minor changes in, in life right now or big monumental times when I'm going off course. And the original times when I said, Lord, like I knew I, I knew about it. And I said, please forgive me, accept me. So when I and I experience, I believe, a supernatural forgiveness where this weight is revealed through being forgiven by God through faith in his in through his, through faith in faith in his son, and then gifted with the Holy Spirit is what this is like this peace that surpasses all understanding, is how the Bible lays it out. 
then now I'm able after being forgiven to forgive. So I think that I have a supernatural advantage to be able to forgive and live out this forgiveness when the people are, and we can apply it back to sales, when they're spitting in your face, when they're saying no, when it's like some will, some won't, you know, whatever you said, and then next, right? Like, so the mindset is that, I, so I'm sharing that with you because you you tie so much to forgiveness and I would not be, I would be omitting some truth if I didn't take the time to say, Jay, I have a supernatural way to, I've experienced forgiveness, right? So, and that can happen on a worldly level, but I mean, I feel forgiven for everything, right? Like I am, it, the Bible says I'm no longer under condemnation, no longer under condemnation. So I'm living free and I'm not going to suffer the consequence, which we all get to see every day, which is death. I'm not going to die, right? So I got some pretty promising things to look forward to that are hopeful. So I, I want to, I will, I'm fine to, to wrap up. But if you have anything else that you want to talk about, I'm open to, to listen to. I have some time. What, what, what would you like the audience to take away from this conversation? Well, you know, my answer is definitely going to be around faith, right? Like, to, to, to do you know, are you forgiven? Do you have your eternity mapped out, your steps to success of eternity? Right. Do you want to know more about it? Like re reach out to me. I will I will shed some more light on that. I will try to talk with you and, and help you understand that. That will be a takeaway, like an act because the time is now. Right. Like you we're not all promised tomorrow or anything like that. Um, then from there for now speaking to an audience, because I know that you're surrounded with a lot of faithful people. And that, that maybe the way that we're acting in faith isn't as much as we actually think that we are. So take the test, find out if you're open, right? Which we talked about, like ask some people some questions, listen to the answers, be, be around the people that care about you, go outside, you know, to other people that are advisors and, and let them key in on what you're doing and how you're doing. Get real close with somebody, be open to them and, you know, ask the hard questions, listen to the answers, take the test of, are you open? And um, then from that point, you know, for an audience that wants to grow and, and does want to make steps and paths and, and ways to move forward, if if they haven't reached out to to Culture Matters to um, to get an evaluation, to, to have a discussion, have a podcast, do the things that you do to verify like, hey, is this person, you know, the right fit um, to see? And, and if not, they'll get redirected to somebody that may be the best fit for them. That that would be the that would be the. Um, the thing that, because it's been so impactful for me, this is what we're talking about. I want it for other people, right? I want others to succeed. Um, I would want others to hear that. It's funny. The thought that came to my mind is that if there's somebody that you think would be a good fit that might want to, you know, learn roofing and siding sales, send them my way, right? Oh, like, yeah. if they're interested in these things, you know, maybe hey, I can where can they follow you on Instagram? What's that? Can you give them your Instagram handle? You know, this is very revealing of how terrible I am with that stuff. I don't even 100% know what it is. I'm going to look at it right now as you say that. Um, so that's me. And it is Robert Freehafer. So it looks like R-O-B-E-R-T-F-R-E-H-A-F-E-R. -E -E um, if that's the right way to, to find that. Yeah, no, that, that's a good place to start. That's what it says I on here. That. <laughs> so and we'll uh, see you all too. My my Facebook is there. I, I share a lot of this stuff there. Robert Freehafer, F R E H A F E R, and um, or Guardian Storm Repair. A lot of it, a lot of stuff is there. They can search it out, check it out. So thanks for giving me that opportunity to um to share some things that I would think the listeners should hear or impact someone else in their life.